Good morning, everyone. Welcome once again to the online edition of our Bible study at the Crossing Community Church. Today, we're going to talk about Exodus 20 and Psalm 16 as we deal with a new section in our study about the Ten Commandments. Now, the Ten Commandments are the supreme expression of God's will in the Old Testament, and, and they merit our close attention. They are to be thought of not as the 10 most important commands among hundreds of others, but as a digest of the entire Torah. The foundation of all the Torah rests in the 10 commandments and somewhere within them, we should be able to find all the law, Jesus expressed the essential unity of the 10 commandments with the rest of the law. When he summarized the law in the famous words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. Now on these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. You can find that in Matthew 22. All the law, as well as the prophets, is indicated whenever the Ten Commandments are expressed. Because many people work primarily with money, an inordinate desire for money is probably the most common work-related danger to the first commandment. Jesus warned of exactly this danger. He said, no one can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and wealth. That's found in Matthew 6. But almost anything related to work can become twisted in our desires to the point that it interferes with our love for God. How many careers come to a tragic end because the means to accomplish things for the love of God, such as political power, financial sustainability, commitment to the job, status among peers or superior performance, becomes ends in themselves. When, for example, recognition on the job becomes more important than character on the job, is it not a sign that reputation is displacing the love of God as the ultimate concern? A practical touchstone is to ask whether our love for God is shown by the way we treat people on the job. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. If we put our individual concerns ahead of our concern for the people we work with, for and among, then we have made our individual concerns our God. In particular, if we treat other people as things to be manipulated, obstacles to overcome, instruments to obtain what we want, or simply neutral objects in our field of view, then we demonstrate that we do not love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. In this context, we can begin to list some work-related actions that have a high potential to interfere with our love for God. Doing work that violates our conscience, working in an organization where we have to harm others to succeed, working such long hours that we have little time to pray or worship, rest, and otherwise deepen our relationship with God, working among people who demoralize us or seduce us away from our love for God, working where alcohol, drug abuse, violence, sexual harassment, corruption, disrespect, racism, or other inhumane treatment mar the image of God in us and the people we encounter in our work. If we can find ways to avoid these dangers at work, even if it means finding a new job, it would be wise to do so. Now, I know if this is not possible, we can at least be aware that we need help and support to maintain our love of God in the face of our work. Exodus 20, verse 4, you shall not make for yourself an idol. The second commandment raises the issue of idolatry. Idols are gods of our own creation, gods that have nothing to them that did not originate with us, gods that we feel we control. 
In ancient times, idolatry often took the form of worshiping physical objects. But the issue is really one of trust and devotion. On what do we ultimately pin our hope of well-being and success? Anything that is not capable of fulfilling our hope, that is, anything other than God, is an idol, whether or not it is a physical object. The story of a family forging an idol with the intent to manipulate God and the disastrous personal, social, and economic consequences that follow are memorably told in the book of Judges, chapters 17 through 21. In the world of work, it is common to speak of money and fame and power as potential idols, and rightly so. Now, they are not idolatrous per se, and in fact may be necessary for us to accomplish our roles in God's creative and redemptive work in the world. Yet, when we imagine that we have ultimate control over them, or by achieving them our safety and prosperity will be secured, we have begun to fall into idolatry. The same may occur with virtually every other element of success, including preparation, hard work, creativity, risk, wealth, and other resources and valuable circumstances. As workers, we have to recognize how important these are. As God's people, we must recognize when we begin to idolize them. By God's grace, we can overcome the temptation to worship these good things in their own right. The development of genuinely godly wisdom and skill for any task is so that your trust may be in the Lord. That's Proverbs 22. The distinctive element of idolatry is the human-made nature of the idol. At work, a danger of idolatry arises when we mistake our power, knowledge, and opinions for reality. When we stop holding ourselves accountable to the standards we set for others, cease listening to others' ideas, or seek to crush those who disagree with us, are we not beginning to make idols of ourselves? Where has God been faithful in my life as a Christian? Where has he been faithful to you? The psalmist here, David, has reflected in these first few verses in Psalm 16 about the faithfulness of God. He sees that God has been faithful in his life. We can see the same areas in which God has met our needs. In my security, Psalm 16, 1, protect me, God, for I take refuge in you. When David was in trouble, God protected him from his enemies. I am sure many of you have needed protection. Ultimately, whatever form that protection takes, its source should be God. Verse 2, in my well-being, I said to Yahweh, you are my Lord. I have nothing good beside you. God is good. He is the source of everything good. Nothing good in my life comes outside of God. Everything that is good in my life derives its goodness from God. Also in my choice of friends, verse 3. As for the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones. All my delight is in them. Now this verse describes other similar faithful people. Part of God's faithfulness in my life has been in providing the faithful people of God around me. I look to my biological family as well as my faith family. Out of this group comes my closest friends. Just as David delighted in these friends in his day, as Christians, we need to be thankful for the friends God has given us in our lives. They help us build confidence in our relationship with God. We all should be helping to build one another in our faith. In my loyalty, Psalm 16, 4. The sorrows of those who take another God for themselves will multiply. The friends that God has provided stand in contrast to the people who deny God. Here, David is contrasting loyalties. He looks around him uh, to the people who are worshiping other gods. This is the reason why they are pouring out drink offerings of blood. This is because they are building a relationship with a false god. They go to the false place of worship 
to spend time with false worshipers of a false god. People can make the same mistake today. They may say, I don't need the church. I can worship God alone without the need of the church. I can love Jesus. I just don't love the church. The fact is that you are lying to yourself if you think you can worship Jesus outside the relationships God designed for you. God designed for you to be part of an eternal family. You won't spend time in heaven alone, so you should not be trying to spend time away from God's family today. So God continues along the spiritual journey with us. If you want to trust him as our Savior and Lord, then we have to believe that he will be there for us, even when others don't trust God. The rest of these verses highlight the fact that God provides for my eternal security. Verses 8 and 9, he is always near me in life. I keep the Lord in mind always because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken and therefore my heart is glad and my spirit rejoices. My body also rests securely. Well, this keeps me secure to know that God is near me. I don't have to be nervous. I can be glad and I can rest securely at night. No matter what is going on around me, God is with me. God will not abandon me in death. That's Psalm 16, 10. For you will not abandon me to show. You will not allow your faithful one to see decay. One of the areas in which a Christian needs to build confidence is about death. The reason is because there's only one person who's come back. We don't have groups of people who can show us what happens when we die and can show us where to go. It's not like we have instant communication with people in the afterlife. This is an area where one really needs to trust God in what he said. Here, this verse is a prophecy about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. At the same time, the psalm speaks about security in death. God will not abandon me. He will be with me in death. Why? Well, God provides eternal security from this life into the next. Verse 11. You reveal the path of life to me, and your presence is abundant joy, and your right hand are eternal. Now, God is near me in this life. Verses 8 and 9. He will not abandon me in death. Verse 10, and the reason is because he's prepared a place for me in the afterlife. He has revealed a path. He will give me joy in his presence. As John Piper stated, fullness of joy and eternal joy cannot be improved. Nothing is fuller than full and nothing is longer than eternal. And this joy is owing to the presence of God, not the accomplishments of man. Building my confidence in my relationship means that I am secure in knowing that God will provide eternal joy and eternal pleasure in an eternal life. It begins with Jesus, it continues every day I live, and it proceeds through the portal of death and ends in the afterlife of eternity in heaven. Because of heaven, I can have eternal confidence in God. Leo Tolstoy, known for his classic work, War and Peace, also wrote a book called A Confession, which he tells the story of his search for meaning and purpose in life. Tolstoy rejected Christianity as a child and went to a university seeking pleasure. In Moscow and St. Petersburg, he drank heavily, he lived a promiscuous life, and he gambled frequently. His ambition was to become wealthy and famous, but nothing satisfied him. In 1862, he married a wonderful woman. They had 13 children. He had everything. Yet he was so unhappy that he was on the verge of suicide. He said, is there any meaning in my life which will not be annihilated by the inevitability of death which awaits me? Tolstoy searched for the answer in every field of science and philosophy. As he looked around, he saw the people were not facing up to the basic questions of life, such as, where did I come from? Where am I going? Who am I? What is life all about? 
Eventually, he found that the peasant people of Russia answered these questions through their Christian faith. And he, too, came to realize that only in Jesus Christ do we find the true meaning of life. I ask that you continue to look inside yourself to see, are you have, do you have any idols that you are promoting? Even to this day, is your idol, as we talked about work, is it sports? Is it television? Is it family? What is it? If it's not just God and only him, then let's reevaluate where we are and how we can get to where we need to be. God bless you for listening. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share this time with you this morning. Enjoy the balance of the week. Continue to pray for one another and support and uplift each other. Attend church regularly if you can. Enjoy the opportunity, even in this time of pandemic, to realize that God is in control.